Are you working on your author career, but struggling to get that first book published? Does the goal of being an author seem too lofty? Or thoughts of having multiple books and making a full-time living are as fantastical as living in Cinderella's castle? Welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where aspiring authors can be heard. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have gotten their foot on the author career path. Hear what they've done to get there and where they want to go now. Settle back. It's time for a bit of inspiration and advice. Come listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. Welcome. Today on Discovered Wordsmiths, I have Jake Brown. This was such a great talk. Jake is involved not only in the author community, which I'll talk about, but he's also been greatly involved in the music community. He's interviewed some of the legends of music and written biographies for them, including Hart, which we discuss, but Tupac and several others that you'll recognize, like Joe Satriani. Um, but we had a really good talk, really fun. But the exciting part for authors is that he has a TV channel, uh, Authors TV, and it's on Tubi, and I think it's on some other places too, but Tubi's the one I watched some of these on. These are big, high-quality production TV show. And the exciting part is that the author business is something that somebody uh, understands is willing to invest in, that somebody's willing to make a high-production quality uh, TV show like this. So the exciting thing for authors, I think, is that there's some – uh, advancement in how the uh, author business is being perceived. So that's something to check out and listen to. It's very exciting. And it was a great talk with Jake. And before that, I've got Kathy on again, talking about some books for the summer, because we've got one month until June. Not that you can tell in Ohio, uh, we've had snow and it's been cold and rainy. So uh, hopefully by June, we might have some of that warm weather that we could sit and enjoy a good book. And Kathy tells us about some of those. So sit back and enjoy another great episode. So welcome once again. Uh, let's talk some books. What do we got? Yeah. I have eight titles. I got a little carried away with awesome. getting ready for summer. <laughs> oh, great. Well, yeah, that, that should be coming sometime in the next six or seven months, maybe. You know. For a day yeah. or two. <laughs> we'll so be let's hopeful see. that it'll be sooner than that. So Yeah, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what do we got? Uh, the first one I have is not actually new. It's Carrie Soto is back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Have you heard of that one? No, I have not. Okay, so lots of people know her now because of Daisy Jones and the Six. It's a popular, it was a hugely popular book, but um, now the Amazon, I think it's Amazon series, is gotten lots of good reviews. So anyhow, she has lots of other books. And uh, Carrie Soto is back, came out last year, and it's actually about a tennis pro. And she's retired, but now there's this young and upcoming tennis player that is gunning after her title as most decorated female tennis player. So it's about her coming back, deciding to come back and kind of, um, I'm losing the word I'm looking for, but she wants to hold on to her title. She doesn't want to give it up as the best tennis player of all times. Nice. So it's really, it's an exciting book. It keeps you going. And I don't think you need to know anything about tennis because I'm not a sports person. And I don't know the first thing about tennis and I loved it. So. Nice. Yeah. We seem to go yeah. in waves sometimes with sports books. It seems yeah. like uh, you won't hear anything for a long time except biographies and memoirs. And then you'll get this book that comes out and it's about cricket or you yeah. know something like that. And it's, everyone loves it. And people are like, wow, people like about weird sports. And then suddenly you get all these weird sports, you know, paper airplane flying and whatever. Right. Right. But it, it's not so much the sport. It takes a good writer to have a good story. Exactly. So. And I mentioned that one because it's coming out in paperback June 6th. Nice. So okay. I know a lot of times books get a new life when they come out in paperback. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. Number one. So. Yeah. So then number two, um, Emily Henry. Lots of people love Emily Henry. She kind of writes rom-com type books. Uh, Book Lovers is one in the past. This one is called Happy Place. And and the description, I have not been able to read this one yet, but rather than telling her friends they've broken up and potentially ruining their annual group trip to a cottage in Maine, 
The last one, in fact, is the cottage will soon be sold. An ex-couple pretends to still be together while on vacation. How could that go wrong? (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that one comes out actually today. And traditionally, her books have been published in paperback, like the trade size paperback. But this one, she's become such a popular author. This one is coming out in hardcover. Nice. Well, congrats to her. I know, right? Of course, if I'm going to go to the beach and lay in a lounge chair and read, I want the smaller paperback. Yeah. I don't want the big thing hitting me in the face when right kid right. runs by or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see both. When I go to the pool or the beach, I see people with both. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next. All right. Number three, I have Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson. This is also one I have not been able to read but it really sounds like it's going to be a good one to me. Um, It came out maybe within the last month. Set among the moneyed and privileged families of New York City, this novel explores the life of a family, the Stocktons, that is filled with memorable characters. Following three distinct women in this group, it explores love, relationships, and family crises with a strong dose of humor. So I think that's got all the main points. (laughs) Yes, yes. And they do sound like beach reads, so. Yes, Yeah, for sure. And then speaking of beach reads, number four, I have uh, The Five Star Weekend by Ellen Hildebrand. So Ellen Hildebrand, a lot of people, she always seems to come out with a book around this time of the year, and a lot of them take place in Nantucket. She also has a Christmas series that is very popular among readers, but I believe that her summer books, the ones that traditionally come out around this time of year, are probably um, her strongest ones. This one actually comes out June 13th. After tragedy strikes and her family life grows ever more complicated, a food blogger decides to organize a five-star weekend in which she invites friends from different decades of her life to spend time with her. All does not go according to plan. However, when unexpected visitors arrive, secrets begin to surface. Ah. So that's the five star weekend and Ellen Hildebrand's interesting. I got to see her in October and she actually longhand writes her novels. One of those people. (laughs) Yes. So she does that. And then I believe she, she also, of course, then types it. However, she starts out longhand and she'll, especially, I think when she, when she's close to being finished, she, goes to a certain place that I believe might be on Nantucket and she goes by herself away from her family and she just writes wow. until she's done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing I'll point out for all the authors listening, uh, you're reading these descriptions and they're just a few sentences. There, yeah. there are a couple, and that's a big, big point to get people interested. It's, it's a craft to just make that little bit of a blurb because I've gone to a couple author shows and things lately. And I'm asking people, you know, tell me about your book. 20 minutes later, they're still droning on about the book and I've checked out. I'm like, (laughs) I have no interest any longer in this book. I have no idea what it's about. And authors, I understand it's your love. You, You want everyone to love it like you do. And you're excited. You're hoping people are buying it, you know, and all that. But but in this case, less is more. If you hook me and intrigue me, two, three sentences, and bam, you got me. If you go 20 minutes, yeah. you don't got me. So yeah, right, just a right. note. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying because as a bookseller, I can be long-winded <laughs> like that. If there is a book that I love, they'll say, oh, well, what's this one about? And, you know, I've got to rein myself in because I want them to buy the book and read it for themselves, right. get their own experience. And here I've told them all the major plot points. So, right. And, yeah. the, and the thing is, uh, even if we don't know the whole story, you know, there's a plot and there's a story. So, and telling all the major plot points, we don't care so much about the rest of the story. Well, right. you know, but it's weird because you get mad at, um, movie trailers because it's like well they gave everything away but the thing is they have found through studies that the more they put into the movie trailer the more people go to the movie if they leave things out it's so weird how we how humans think and operate (laughs) yeah for sure (laughs) all right what's the next one (laughs) okay number five um only love can hurt like this by page tune this actually comes out today and i got to read this one ahead of time and that's why i put this on the list because it um is one of those nice easy feel good 
romances. It still has some drama in it and things like that. But Rem is the main character. She lives in England with her mother. Her parents uh, were divorced when she was younger and her dad is from America, but she stayed in England with her mom. So she is engaged to be married. They break up. You find that out right at the beginning. So she comes to spend the, some time with dad in America. And of course, she meets the boy next door type of thing. And there's all kind of issues and ghosts in his closet. And she's got her own. And so it's just going through all of their relationship I guess, phobias between each other and working out a way, are they going to actually date or not? So I thought it was very good. It was the first time I have read that author and I enjoyed it. It kept nice. me entertained. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. The Summer of Songbirds, number six by Christy Woodson Harvey. So Christy Woodson Harvey is an author that was new to me through the pandemic. She was not an author I'd heard of before. But um, I started with, oh, I don't remember which book of hers I started with. However, The Summer of Songbirds is equal parts moving and nostalgic. In her latest novel, a story of four friends who unite to save a summer camp and find out much more about friendship, love, and their own lives in the process. She's really good at weaving a story and all the characters have a lot of depth to them and a lot of family and strong ties and you just really care about all of her characters so i think it's kind of neat that it's a summer camp type of you know friends that meet at summer camp and come back together kind of thing so i'm looking forward to reading that one of hers nice okay well there's yeah. You know, coming up, hopefully someday it'll warm up in Ohio. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and there's uh, some great summer reads uh, yeah. for people. So I love it. And also, I don't think I recognize any of the authors. And oh, that's okay. the focus of what I've always wanted to do is help expand people. You know, I, I've fallen into the trap. Oh, I like Stephen King. Oh, I like Ian Douglas. Sure. Uh, you know, and I go look in the bookstore. There's a new Stephen King. There's it. And now I've got five books. It's all authors I've read before. Well, sure. Unless you try out new authors, you don't have new author books to read. Right, so, right. You know, that's always, hopefully people, I'll put links uh, in the show notes to all these books. So I think that's great. So yeah. so give us an update. How are things going with your pop-up books of go-go? Things are going really well. I'm having a good time. I um, will be at Lost Trail Winery this weekend for Independent Bookstore Day. Yes. So yeah, I'm excited that I get to participate as a bookstore for Independent Bookstore Day. Nice. So yeah, it's really going well. The, at the two book club, the two book clubs that I have are uh, going well, and everybody seems to enjoy the titles. We're getting to know each other since it's a new kind of thing, and uh, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. I have things scheduled all throughout the summer and having a great time doing it. Great. Good. Well, I wish you more luck. So Thank we'll have you. you back on in a couple of weeks, probably as summer's uh, in the swing and we'll see what new books are coming out or what new things you've discovered. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks, Kathy. Appreciate right. you being on. Yeah, no problem. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. So today, and I've got a great uh, author on my podcast. He's got some great pictures and stuff in the background. This is Jake Brown. Jake, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Me, I should say, in the show by extension. Right. So is that really signed by heart? Yeah, that's I co-wrote that book with them years and years ago. Bless their hearts in two, back in 2006 and seven. Wow. And then I met them in 2009 and they signed that. And comically, I was sitting there in the Ryman's dressing room waiting to meet them. And I was so nervous as understandably anyone who grew up on heart would be that they would like the book too. Cause this is my first time hearing, did they like it? Did they hate it? And Alison Krauss and her husband are sitting there as well. And I didn't even know I was polite. I talked to them, but I, but I wasn't like, Oh, you're out. And it wasn't that I ever get like that, but I was almost too passive. So she leaves and uh, cause everyone else was getting her, the manager for heart comes in and she goes, Oh, it's so nice. She got along with Allison and her husband. And I felt like a jerk cause they brought them out later. She came out later on stage and saying these dreams with oh, Nancy wow. Wilson, but they're, they were the sweetest. I wrote that kind of at a point in my career where 
it's fair to say that I had written authors. I've been doing this 25 years and 55 books. So at this point, I've gone through peaks and valleys like everybody. But I had written mass market hip hop paperbacks for five straight years. And it was reaching a point where I either needed to, in my career trajectory, I needed to start writing for bigger audiences, publishers, et cetera, or not. And the Tupac Shakur estate authorized a book through Afini Shakur's mother called Tupac in the studio that actually launched this series. And then Hart was the next to say yes to it. And that put me on a different, that put me in a different league. And then that got me nice. an audience with Lemmy. And we wrote the oh. Motorhead in the studio book. And so things just started rolling. So I hang it there because it has perpetually been like my good luck charm. Nice. We're just jumping right into things. And everybody listening is probably like, okay, Steve, shut up. Let Jake talk because he's way more interesting. <laughs> but, no, I'm but, certainly talking too much. I'm happy to answer any questions you have though. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. See, what I would have done if I was Hart, knowing you were nervous, if my agent said, hey, this guy's really nervous or something, I would have come in and slammed those, what the hell, this book sucks, I can't stand it, and just messed with you. And then I would have told you how much I liked it. But <laughs> that's just yeah. me. And that's probably why I'm not in that position. <laughs> One thing that was cool is Nancy Wilson told me that she had not only read it, but her kids had read it and Cameron Crowe had read it, who at the time they were married. Wow. And that, and growing up and influence the size he was on me through fast times and say, say anything right. and this kind of stuff. I was definitely, definitely honored at that. Are you able to edit this? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Hey, give me 30 seconds. I got to we'll do. We'll do. Give me just one second. I got a sign for this UPS. Oh yeah. My bad. So one flaw. Sorry about that. No, not a problem. Not a problem. Yeah, man. So that, that kind of got things launched. And then a few years later, I had another opportunity to write a book with Joe Satriani. Oh, his memoir was a musical memoir, which I'm careful to say because at some point he will do his own. I'm sure more I was born on this date. And, but we really got into every, if you're a fan of whether it's Flying a Blue Dream or Surfing with the Alien, the early stuff all the way through his more recent work, it doesn't, it, we, we did the paperback update in 2017. So there's a couple records past that, but you can really hear firsthand from him. And one thing I started doing with these books that became a sort of key part of how I write books is I think first person narrative, if it's going to be like in Joe's case, is really exciting for the fans. But if you can blend that, and it's not me, I'm not the only one that does this, but I try to do it a little bit. With the in the studio books, I talk to all the engineers, the producers, the song, the songwriters, the guitar players, the band members, past, present, whatever, to the degree the artist allows me. And we, and that's been pretty thoroughly through that series. And we reconstruct every one of these records. So as you're listening to them, you can read along with pretty much every sound, lyric, lick, drum beat, etc. You hear, and that kind of echoed outward into this Kenny Aronoff book. The drummer, Kenny Arnold, he was yep. John Mellencamp's drummer in the 80s, probably got 200 number ones. I met him through the Satriani book. So what I mean is you also get opportunities where you meet people through. That led to this USA Today article I have framed up here from Beyond the Beats in 2018, where I interviewed God. And that first book we had, Lars Ulrich, Tommy Lee, Joey Kramer, or the drummers from Aerosmith, Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses, Jane's Addiction, Foo Fighters, Taylor Hawkins, give me a really elaborate one, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Journey, Creedence Clearwater Revival. It was just an incredible list, Smashing Pumpkins. So there's been a kind of weird pattern throughout my music writing career where one project typically initiates another, initiates another. Teddy Riley, legendary king of New Jack Swing, inventor of that genre, my prerogative writer, producer. And that's coming out, we hope, at the end of this year or early next year, but it's actually being shot right presently. So there's a lot of these projects gestate sometimes over long periods. Sometimes you write them in two or three years sometimes you write them in seven or eight years sometimes you write them in a year it just depends on the contract um, yeah so all of that laid the groundwork for what i do now which i can get into when you'd like that national yeah. songwriter series you see <laughs> right there is another one so they just i profile all the songwriters on music row and chronicle the stories behind them and their songs they write all the country music hits that you hear on the radio for the most part so it's been a very interesting definitely career not yeah TV. it sounds like it <laughs> So something you said, and I'm going to jump on while we're fresh for authors, you did a project. It led to the next project. It led to the next. Sometimes you hear this. I'm just not getting anything that I like or what. Sometimes you got to get out. You got to improve your odds. You got to get out there, do the, do the work. And music's that way too. Just sitting at home in your living room, waiting for that 
agent to call or that band or whatever. Sometimes I found a band I played with because I went to an open mic night and they were playing with, and they said, Hey, we're, I was listening to them. I'm like, wow, these guys are pretty good. I enjoy it. And they said, Hey, we're looking for a bassist. I went, Hey, let's talk. If I yeah. hadn't gone. So same thing with writing it, anything creative always needs that. Yeah. And there's a, it's called always be writing is the rule. And I ghost write on top of the 50 plus in my own catalog. I've ghosted another 40 books, I think over the last 10, 15 years just to pay bills. And if you, and then I'm writing scripts for the show when I'm not writing those, if you're not writing, you just, you're not a writer. And that's just the cold, hard truth of it. Then that, now with that said, writer's block, I don't believe in writer's block because it's an example of a lot of people I talk to for the show, authors, and I'm sure that you do, they start in journalism. You don't, they don't, editors don't care if you're not inspired. If you have a <laughs> word count, a deadline, you write it and deliver it. It's the same thing with a book. If a publisher puts up a contract and they're paying you in advance to write a book, write the book. Now that sounds overly simplified, but if you do it long enough, you get into the rudiments of that to be able, if you're having a bad day with one chapter, you flip to another. If you're having a hard time with one character, work on another. If you're having a time timeline issues, one timeline, work on the next. Right, so yeah. there's never an excuse to not be writing something. Or if you're not writing, edit. Go over your own material again and again and again. And if you're having problems with it, think about it or listen to it on. We get a lot of people that talk about the benefit now with technology and Word even has, and Google has it too. You can have one of these deals where it reads to you out loud. Right. You can hear so many things that you wouldn't see reading when you hear something to know what, okay. And then maybe you just sat there that day and listened from an editing standpoint, and then you, okay, I fixed all these things or this needed to go. It might lead you to a new door. So that theme is important because in 2020, I got stranded like millions of people at home. And I had written this book. You see how thick that is? 600 yeah. page. <laughs> First Country Music Producers Guide of Its Kind had every one of the big guys and ladies all under one roof, had their old backstories, the hit, stories behind their hits, etc. We're going out to promote, and my publicist calls me and says, Barnes & Noble has called the publisher, the publisher just called me, book's not coming out in physical because they're closing all the stores. So, in other words, everything we had planned for this could not be really done, and then Zoom came into the mix I think like 3,000 people had Zoom in February of 2020 and 3 million people had it by <laughs> right. April. Yeah. So by the time I was catching on to it in May, four months into its big boom, it was already, thank goodness, established. And so we went out and did morning shows. We did a bunch of, a very long list of really nice podcasts and all a lot of them very new because it was like this new boom happening. But also in the course of all of that, I for years have wanted to adapt the format of doing like what we're doing or what I do with bands to authors. And part of that, and I want to be very respectful of podcasts like yours, which allow this, but one of the things I ran into in 2020 that was really maddening when you're trying to promote a book, you have a finite amount of time to do it in. And a lot of the peers that I deal with ran into the same thing is because there was a big advent of new podcasts happening and publishers were just pushing everything they could out you would wind up for 10 minutes of 45 minutes or an hour talking about the book and the other 50 minutes would be spent not on the book. Often it would be spent talking about how different the podcast was from all its competitors <laughs> where there is post-production and that can be done in post. And then you can spend more time talking to the author. And I get it. It was like a thing where people were all competing for the same listeners and it was a whole new thing. So I took a lot from that campaign and things I thought podcast did really well and things that I wanted to do that I realized I couldn't do in that format. But streaming television had just, it had been around, but it hadn't really had that Tiger King thing kind of, <laughs> if that guy gets a streaming television thing, anybody should get one. So it was like, okay, what if I could put together a TV show, which is really crazy sounding, where I have a set, which is about a mile from me in Hendersonville here in Nashville where I film. Nice. Yeah. And just start and start formatting this around the idea of episodic length streaming television, which is not, didn't exist in the format of author interviewing author right. where we went over the whole career and started like I do in the books with the musicians. So we talk about childhood and go all the way up. Now that's not unique in the fact that like your podcasts or lots of other great podcasts 
talk with authors in the time frames that exist for that. But sometimes as you, you might be getting somebody on and all they can really talk about is that one book they're promoting. You know what I mean? <laughs> or whatever. So the idea here was that, first of all, it was going to only work if a streaming network picked it up. And we initially had some potential with an Amazon thing. And then there was all of these really well-intentioned and really left-wing voting apparatuses with their iPhones that were making documentaries. And Amazon had a self video publish kind of pipeline that Jeff Bezos just stopped. So there was no nonfiction content going to Amazon for a year. And that was probably really healthy for, just to let <laughs> the content be more about non-political things. But it also shut out like educational programming. It shut right, out all these right. things. So we had to go out and pitch this. And I went ahead and financed a $30,000 production overhead out of my royalty checks for the year and anything I could ghostwrite, built the set, started reaching out to authors like Brad Meltzer, Sue Monk Kidd, some of the amazing people yeah. that signed on at first, Heather Graham, Catherine Coulter. And I just started throwing it at the biggest names that I'd grown up reading that were the biggest influence on me because I thought, you know, it, I want to start big and see if I get any interest in this. And because I was an author of 50 books as a host, I can talk, you know, with them about, and luckily it worked, man. So we're over 700 authors in two years later, seasons Ooh. one or two got picked up. God bless them by Tubi television, Tubi TV. I saw that. Uh, yeah. And uh, there's 54 episodes in seasons one and two. There's another 68 that are going to be coming here in what we're talking about seasons three and four. And I actually, I have a little blurb I can read you. Yeah, that's actually, please, please. I've just been putting together. The frustration with streaming is you get approved and then they accept it, but then it can take three to four weeks for it to gestate down into the viewing cycles or algorithms, however that works. So I've been working on this press release, but we put together with seasons three and four, there's the Oscar winning Martian. It, it basically says, if you're interested in getting together with the creators of the Martian, the Lincoln Rhyme franchise, Star Wars, Bones, Indiana Jones, True Blood, billion dollar box office franchise, Rambo, Shining Girls, Donnie Brasco, The Goonies, Poltergeist, Blondie, Longmire, Troll Hunters, uh, Spike TV's doing the Mars trilogy from Kim Stanley Robinson, Happen Leonard, Judy Moody. It goes on and on. And then you went, we went back in time to Sarah Paretsky and Erica Jong, pioneers that were doing this when nobody else was in variations of crime fiction in Paretsky's case and in Erica Jong's case. Really, Fear of Flying launched the second, helped launch the second wave of feminism. Joyce Carol Oates was like an absolute shock that opportunity came. And that's what I mean. So once word of mouth started getting out between 2021, when I was producing 2022, when it launched and just now 2023, we've had over 2 million viewers. And that's just come between the YouTube channel and Tubi. And that's just all come from organic word of mouth. Nice. Because the other thing that we got was absolutely no press. Nobody would cover the show. Nobody would give us any on the mainstream level of that. And it was really an eye-opening thing for me because quite honestly, you get a little bit insulated and comfortable as a music biographer when you write books with famous bands because you get used to being on, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? I don't mean that in a negative ego way. It's just yeah, people well, call and they're like, hey, we're doing it like music's greatest mysteries. I've been lucky to be a cast member on that show for a few <laughs> years now, breaking the bands. You get these invitations and I don't do a lot of them, but I do the ones that I think are really cool that'll be to the fan bases I write for. But this was like, guys, you had my last five books in parade. What do you mean you're not going to give us well, even a little blurb? They were like, right. you're the competition now, dude. You're not our... So, yeah, sorry to... Yeah, if you didn't realize this, there's probably not people going to the store going, oh my God, a Jake Brown book. Oh, who's this heart man? I'm, I'm pr probably that's not what they're buying it for. They're no offense for to you. <laughs> but what I mean is, even in that regard though, Joe Satriani was the kindest press sharer I've ever done a book. Oh, that's he cool. Out, I love he went out that. to CBS, to Hollywood Reporter, to <clears throat> anywhere, Variety, all kinds of magazines that he could have completely been like, yep, he was great. Let's talk about me. And he, yes. and he was so generous. <laughs> and so what I'm saying is that kind of thing. And then afterward, with a lot of the bands, I've been fortunate, as sad as it is, like Lemmy passing, you get you sometimes get brought in to do that talking head stuff because you worked with that person and maybe right. like you were maybe only one of a couple of people that got lucky to. So all of that went away. So we had to build this from the organic ground up. And you know what did it, we were very blessed, was the authors, social media, Twitter, 
uh, post the election era really changed and became more organic and grassroots again. And there was a lot less of the stigma. Oh, you're on Twitter. Trump's on Twitter. Just keeping it real. Whether you were pro him or against him, it just went. It, so Twitter has been a lifeline for us on top of YouTube, which has been the absolute reason we are existent. Because what we do on the YouTube channel is we'll do early premieres. We'll do advanced sort of previews. We'll do promos. But we're pumping out new author uh, interaction every week in terms of new authors we're interviewing, even if we're months away from filming, like their actual, I have the set I reshoot at, but we're just really trying to keep an organic connection with the people watching the show that are fans of the authors, that want to hear in length about their catalog. Some of these episodes run two hours. Some of them run wow. an hour and 45 minutes. And yeah, and my host clips are as clipped as they can be. So the majority of the time you're spending are with the authors. Um, and I mentioned like seasons one and two, just as highlights, it was like T.C. Boyle, Karen Slaughter, Brad Meltzer, Ian Rankin, Scott Turow, Catherine Coulter, Heather Graham, Chris Bahalian, John Lasquat. We had Lee Bailey's final televised interview before he passed. Oh. A career length. Yeah. John Douglas, who created, they created Mindhunter over. So it just, it continued within seasons three and four. I mentioned Joyce Carol Oates, there's Jeffrey Deaver, there's Barry Eisler, there's Craig Johnson from Longmire. There's all kinds of... Joe R. Lansdale, Sherilyn Kenyon, Joe Pistone, like it was Donnie Brasco, who oh. wrote a bunch of books. Yeah, yeah I was looking on, on Tubi. I was going through the list. I was supposed to be watching a movie with my son. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be talking yeah. to this guy. And oh, look at these authors. And he's like, yeah, that's great. Can we watch the movie now? I'm like, you right. don't get it. This is like huge. It's been, yeah. And the thing that it's been really rewarding about it is our, fa our viewers range from teenagers all the way up to retirees who are just starting to figure out they want to write a book. It's an ageless profession. We are certainly not the first to say that. As you figure, talk about in your podcast, people start at all ages. They do yeah. a job. Their kids are off to college. Okay, they can finally write a book. Mom's been at home. A very common story. Mom's at home with, and now she has some time and they go off to school or right. whatever it is that you get that little bit of time every day to write. It leads to these kinds of careers. And many, most, 95% of the people that we talked to, it wasn't like a, oh, my dad was an author and I'm an actor, or he was an actor, I'm an actor, because there was no familial help. It was like every one of these people went through the same things that everyday auth people trying to become authors do and did. And the other thing that we really try to emphasize is like aspiring authors, there's a Bible of advice in the show, like I'm sure on your podcast, we try to pull as much of that out as we can about the everyday life of a writer. Right. You might have a million seller book, then it might be 10 years before you have another. And then you might just be writing for a living in between then. And so there's always kinds of things that we hear about, whether it's agent, good or bad agent stories, editor stories, whatever kind of writing someone did to break in that they maybe don't want to talk about, but we try to touch on to just glean from what they got out of it that they took forward with them. So the idea is that whether you're a kid, you're in your 20s, 30, 40, 50, 60s, or whether you're just a fan of this author. You don't want to watch skip five episodes and then you might find another one you like. Yeah. So the idea is a kind of a combination of discovery and education as nerdy as those themes can sound within the realm of books. They're very exciting. You have a billion dollar budget movie in fiction. You can go anywhere you want on the page. And so we hear about these amazing um, minds that are creating, like we have a science fiction edition, Locust Magazine. And in fact, tomorrow is going to be airing Kim Stanley Robinson's episode. And there's a whole science fiction edition. There's 40, 45 authors coming up all across that wow. spectrum, men and women from all those generations. There's a horror edition coming up. I have a UK edition, seasons five and six, which is going to be 80 episodes. I'm actually filming now. So hopefully within the next year or two, we're going to aim to build the largest on streaming episodic archive of author interviews. I, that, that's, so that's awesome. the goal. That's, That's awesome. The, the yeah. service, not only for authors, but for people reading or people that are like, I haven't been reading much, but that looks interesting. Or And for kids, I love that. And the fact that you're on a TV station, Tubi, YouTube, it's video, it's big name people, smaller name across the board. I mean, the... I don't think some people realize that the benefits to the whole author community that you're doing, it's phenomenal. We're, yeah, we're, and you know what? I appreciate that, but I say it in, in Congress of this being a community of people, and I say that not because it's the cheesy thing that you say. It's really true. I Nobody would watch this if the authors who agreed to be on it didn't go out and promote it to their fan bases, bottom line. Right. So I try to vocalize that credit as much as possible. At the same time, it's really notable as well, to your point, that not only are we profiling the 100 million selling catalogs, Dean Koontz, someone like that. But we go, we really do profile like Disha Filia won the National Book Award. She just came out with Secret Lives of Church Women. We have a spectrum, Janine Cummings of the American Dirt. There's some really prolific 
authors that are new, but they're really building amazing catalogs. Attica Locke, who's really an amazing fiction author that also wrote on Empire. I had Don Winslow on last week. We talked all about his catalog. He's going into retirement from this to focus full time on film. Yeah. So the, Richard Russo from Empire Falls was just on. So we're starting to with John Banville. So the, when I sometimes the other thing is I get these really daunting assi interview assignments. And so if you're a writer and then they ask me, so you're, did you retire from book writing to do this? I said, no, quite in tandem. But all the script writing I do, and I do elaborate prep, I do really extensive question guides and everything, is I really try to honor their catalogs without fluff questions, but in depth things that I'm not suggesting other people ask, but I have gotten feedback from in terms of, hey, I really liked that we talked for 10 minutes about a book that no one bought, but I love. As much as we talked about the big hit series that everyone keeps buying. That, that's um, pretty cool. I like that. It's, it's a responsibility, I think. I, I get that. Yeah. And you're you're actually one of the more prolific long-term authors that I've interviewed. The whole idea of this was to get newer authors that no one knows about. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't know your name. Jokingly, I said about... Oh, there are. Yeah, I know. Things, I'm going to... But yeah. that was the whole idea because it didn't really exist. And I think you're on the next level of something like that. So well, I, I know you got a hard out. I don't want to hold you up. Uh, oh, I know. We're good late. for another few. But, um, yeah. but so tell us about what are some of the latest books you've been writing and what's been coming out? What's, what have those been? Because we have talked a lot about, but we've jumped around a bit. And I think that's awesome because the energy yeah. of the podcast is great. Yeah, new books are, I'm trying to think of what I can, I you know what I have to confess that I can't stand? I can't stand with the whole like, I can't really talk about that because it's under con Like this and that, <laughs> but it's true. And a lot of the people I talk to when I'm like, come on, just, and they can't. So it's really, it has that kind of sheen of ego, so, but there's no, so you're under you, contract, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you too. I'll okay. You yeah. Too. Are you still doing the music biographies? Or yes, you doing, yes, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. I just, it, I say it almost humorously because I'm writing it with the artist, but if the artist, like the manager finds out and then we get in trouble because they're trying to sell it. But yeah. the one that is going out that I, that is, we've done enough on the people who are fans of Teddy Riley and New Jack Swing. New Jack City was a movie based on the sound that this guy grew up making records out of his mom's apartment in the projects in Harlem, right. whether it was New Jack, whether it was Bobby Brown, no, My Prerogative or Keith Sweat or Johnny Kemp or guy or as he graduated to michael jackson and then black street and then on and on he's just had one of the most indisputably singularly influential careers in music and i had the privilege for the last eight and a half nine years we've been working on this book quietly together so it's going to be hitting store shelves at some point this year i read a lot of hip-hop just but now i do it i only do authorized books as i have for years now because i think it just gives me a chance to get much more personal with the right. with the artists and corrupt from the death row era is another artist that i've been working with wow. and that's fun we've got doc in that book and snoop and daz and all the death row camp if you're a fan of the chronic you're a fan of doggy style those records i grew up on from the 90s and 80s i'm a child of the 80s high school in the 90s you'll enjoy that book there is a volumes three and four in nashville songwriter are at some point in 2024 going to get out that's there's like a that's probably a two book deal because that's like a 700 page thing and I'm not cutting from it. So it's got to be cut in half so it can be, because that's the other thing I try to do is, is really keep these stories as authentic with the songwriters or with the producers. I've got my behind the board series, which is Nashville, but also has two rock. Uh, there's a volume two and three of Beyond the Beats coming out at some point here in the next couple of years. And I've got an audiobook deal with Blackstone that they've been very patiently working with me on because they're exorbitantly expensive and irritating to record. And I read them myself and then I have to employ editors to edit them. So it makes it sound like I did it competently, full disclosure. <laughs> uh, and we weave in interviews from the actual artists that I talk to. So that oh, is drummers and beyond cool. the beats. Yeah. Doctors of Rhythm have the hip hop producers. So it's more time consuming, but yeah, between all of that, and then it's a seven day a week endeavor doing this show. So I, if I get six hours a night of sleep, I'm happy. I interview probably 10 authors a week for new episodes. We film another five for the upcoming. So it's just, I'm blessed to be in the third decade in this career, man. And one thing I say to anybody who asks me about it is always be writing, always be trying to think out of the box, always be thinking about marketing, which people hate to do. They think, oh, I'm going to hide away and write my book. And then when I get done, it'll all work out. If you get done and you, and I, even with the ghost writing I do, we try to do proposals while we're doing it and have an idea of where we're going to be putting it when it's done. Because the whole point in writing a book is not 
It's first to do it for yourself, but then theoretically it's to do it for readers. Think about the whole point of why we're talking here. It's because all of these authors made these indelible impressions on their readers. And then those readers in turn hear about how they created those books. If you were just to say, well, I don't really talk about how, and some people do, some people are very, or they're like Stephen King and they've just done so right. many interviews that lowly me or whoever is not going to, but I really, we really try to honor the catalogs and get the full story and do it in a way that you can sit at home on a Friday night and watch it. If you're really book nerdy or, or while you're on the gym, you at the gym, you can listen to it on your phone. You can, we don't, we don't do like a podcast version because it's a, you can stream it and listen. Right. And we don't want to, the other thing is I really tried to be respectful of is there's so many great people like yourself doing book podcasts. There's fr Friends of Fiction, which Patty Callahan Henry hosts and some others and her partners. There's a lot of great new content for authors looking for tools on how to do this in the space. And yeah, that's something we just really try to across the genre, every genre, every generation, we try to profile because that could be the next whomever or right. someone watching that could be like, you know what, like E.L. James was, that was, there was a lot of fan fiction that came out of that era that launched new authors. There was yeah. a lot, yeah. So hopefully roundly watching the show, you're getting a sense of these people's careers, their catalogs, their advice, and how to move forward in your own writing career. And you said something about the marketing. I think the way the mindset authors miss, for example, the heart book, if you were, if you didn't have other people promoting it, but if you were hesitant to market it, to get that, the word out there, then all the heart fans would miss that book. And they want, they're, they're, like longing and dying for it because they love heart. The same with just about any book. That's the mark. You're not trying to get people to buy your book. You're giving them an opportunity for some entertainment they want rather than entertainment they don't really want, but it's there. And on top of that, yeah, we try like heart souls at the, that book for years was sold at their shows. Joe Satriani sells that book on his G3 tours all over the world. Bands go out these days and tour to make a living. It's a bottom line. So if you're writing with a band that you can then negotiate to get the book on their merch table, as an example of thinking out of the box, that's what I'm talking about. This show was a completely out of the box concept. I have a wonderful agent, Frank Wyman at Folio Lit that helped me guide me on it. Um, and I've been doing it 25 years. So I've been 35 instead of four, 34 instead of 44. I don't know that I would have had the experience and maturity and have made the mistakes. I've made as many as I've had successes. Mm -hmm. I tell you right before we go, 2014, I had reached a peak. So starting from 2001, I was 24. I got my first book deal here. There's I was 37, 38. I don't know. I had peaked. I had had more press than I could have asked for this book and you for Satriani. I could not sell a book to save my life for 2015, no matter who I called, no matter with my age. So it you every author that's successful is also going to be prepared to go through dips of not being successful. And you have to reinvent yourself every few years. And so this show is, thank goodness, me giving an opportunity to reinvent myself a little bit and learn so much. Imagine getting to, we both get to learn so much from the people yeah. that we listen to. And that's the whole point is we can all learn more. We can all do better. Even if we're successful, there's always people competing for that next reader dollar. And, you know, people think, Oh, don't judge a book by its cover. They all do. So like the bottom line, <laughs> Mine is the more depth we can give anyone beyond that cover, we're trying to because we're in such a quick phase now with the way people take in their reading, even their audiobook or their. My wife is a voracious reader, but she's also a voracious audiobook listener. Anyway, I, we just have tried to and been lucky to fit into this new 2020s format. And we just hope people keep watching and appreciate anyone who does. You can go to the YouTube channel about the authors TV, Twitter, Tubi, you just search about and it'll pull up and about the authors TV. And we thank you so much for yeah. helping promote it. And I'll put links in the show and it's great talking to you. I appreciate everything you've said. There's been tons in here for authors, yeah, but I hope musicians who like bands will check out the books. Me too. I appreciate it. Thank All right. You so Thanks, much. Jake. Take care, buddy. Bye. Hi, if you enjoyed this episode of Discovered Wordsmiths, please support the author. Go to their website, go to Amazon, look them up, get the book. And if you click on the link that I have in the show notes, you'll also help support the podcast so I can keep the hosting and all the software I use and uh, keep it running for, to help more authors. When I am recording this, we've got over 100 episodes, lots of authors. Go to the website, discoveredwordsmiths.com. Check it out. There's a lot of great authors, probably in some genre that you love. See what they have. Check out their books. That's what the point of the podcast is for. 
so people can discover new authors, find some new books they love, support the authors so they can continue writing. So please support them. And if you do like the podcast, if you've been thinking of podcasting or you're a writer, I've got some links also at the website. Click on those if you're interested in any of the software or services that I talk about. Everything that I have there is something I use, so I've got an affiliate link. Again, it's a little bit, if everyone clicked on those, if they were going to get it anyway, it helps keep the podcast going. So let's all help each other out and discover more, sorry, discover more, discover more authors to read. Thank you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.